AI superintelligence as you guys raised concerns of potential human extinction? Because unless we figure out how do we guarantee that the AI systems are safe, we are toast. And you've been so influential on the subject of AI, you wrote the textbook that many of the CEOs who are building some of the AI companies now would have studied on the subject of AI. Yep. So do you have any regrets? Um. Professor Stuart Russell has been named one of Time Magazine's most influential voices in AI. After spending over 50 years researching, teaching, and, and finding ways to design, design AI in such a way that humans maintain control. You talk about this gorilla problem as a way to understand AI in the context of humans. Yeah, so a few million years ago, the human line branched off from the gorilla line in evolution. And now the gorillas have no say in whether they continue to exist because we are much smarter than they are. So intelligence is actually the single most important factor to control planet Earth. But we're in the process of making something more intelligent than us. Exactly. Why don't people stop then? Well, one of the reasons is something called the Midas touch. So King Midas is this legendary king who asked the gods, can everything I touch turn to gold? And we think of the Midas touch as being a good thing, but he goes to drink some water, the water has turned to gold. And he goes to comfort his daughter, and his daughter turns to gold. And so he dies in misery and starvation. So this applies to our current situation in two ways. One is that greed is driving these companies to pursue technology with the probabilities of extinction being worse than playing Russian roulette. And that's even according to the people developing the technology without our permission. And people are just fooling themselves if they think it's naturally going to be controllable. So, you know, after 50 years, I could retire, but instead I'm working 80 or 100 hours a week trying to move things in the right direction. So if you had a button in front of you, which would stop all progress in artificial intelligence, would you press it? Not yet. I think there's still a decent chance that guarantees safety, and I can explain more of what that is. I see messages all the time in the comment section that some of you didn't realize you didn't subscribe. So if you could do me a favor and double check if you're a subscriber to this channel, that would be tremendously appreciated. It's the simple, it's the free thing that anybody that watches this show frequently can do to help us here to keep everything going in this show in the trajectory it's on. So please do double check if you subscribed and uh, thank you so much because in a strange way you are, you're part of our history and you're on this journey with us and I appreciate you for that. So yeah, thank you. Professor Stuart Russell, OBE. A lot of people have been talking about AI for the last couple of years. It appears you've, this really shocked me, it appears you've been talking about AI for most of your life. Well, I started doing AI in high school um, back in England, but then I did my PhD starting in 82 at Stanford. I joined the faculty at Berkeley in 86. So in my 40th year as a professor at Berkeley, the main thing that the AI community is familiar with in my work uh, is a textbook that I wrote. Is this the textbook that most students who study AI are likely learning from? Yep. So you wrote the textbook on artificial intelligence 31 years ago. You actually started, probably started writing it because it's so bloody big in the year that I was born. So I was born in 92. Uh, yeah, it took me about two years to... Me and your book are the same age, which just is wonderf a wonderful way for me to understand just how long you've been talking about this it, it, and how long you've been writing about this. And actually, it's interesting that many of the CEOs who are building some of the AI companies now probably learnt from your textbook. You had a conversation with somebody who said that in order for people to get the message that we're going to be talking about today, there would have to be a catastrophe for people to wake up. Can you give me context on that conversation and a gist of who you had this conversation with? Uh, so it was with one of the CEOs of uh, a leading AI company. He sees two possibilities, as do I, which is um, either we have a small or let's say small scale disaster of the same scale as Chernobyl. The nuclear meltdown in Ukraine. Yeah, so this uh, nuclear plant blew up in 1986 killed uh, a fair number of people directly and maybe tens of thousands of people indirectly through uh, radiation. Recent cost estimates, more than a trillion dollars. So that would wake people up, that would get the governments to regulate. He's talked to the governments and they won't do it. So 
he looked at this Chernobyl scale disaster as the best case scenario because then the governments would regulate and require AI systems to be built. And is this CEO building an AI company? He runs one of the leading AI companies. And even he thinks that the only way that people will wake up is if there's a Chernobyl-level nuclear disaster? Uh, yeah, no, it wouldn't have to be a nuclear disaster. It would be either an AI system that's being misused by someone, for example, to engineer a pandemic, or an AI system that does something itself, such as crashing our financial system or our communication systems. The alternative is a much worse disaster where we just lose control altogether. You have had lots of conversations with lots of people in the world of AI, both people that are, you know, have built the technology, have studied and researched the technology, or the CEOs and founders that are currently in the AI race. What are some of the, the interesting sentiments that the general public wouldn't believe that you hear privately about their perspectives? Because I find that so fascinating. I've had some private conversations with people very close to these tech companies, and the shocking sentiment that I was exposed to was that they are aware of the risks often, but they don't feel like there's anything that can be done. So they're carrying on, which is, feels like a bit of a paradox to me. Like it's- yes, it's, it's, it, it must be a very difficult position to be in, in a sense, right? You're, you're doing something that you know has a good chance of bringing an end to life on Earth, including that of yourself and your own family. They feel that they can't escape this race. Right. If they, you know, if a CEO of one of those companies was to say, you know, we're, we're not going to do this anymore, they would just be replaced. Because the investors are putting their money up because they want to create AGI and reap the benefits of it. So it's a strange situation where every, at least all the ones I've spoken to, I haven't spoken to Sam Altman about this, but, you know, Sam Altman even before becoming CEO of OpenAI, said that creating superhuman intelligence is the biggest risk to human existence that there is. My worst fears are that we cause significant, we, the field, the technology, the industry, cause significant harm to the world. You know, Elon Musk is also on record saying this. So uh, Dario Amade estimates up to a 25% risk of extinction. Was there a particular moment when you realised that these CEOs are well aware of the extinction level risks? I mean, they all signed a statement in May of 23. Uh, called, it's called the extinction statement. It basically says AGI is an extinction risk at the same level as nuclear war and pandemics. But I don't think they feel it in their gut. You know, imagine that you are one of the nuclear physicists. You know, I guess you've seen Oppenheimer, right? So yeah. you're there, you're watching that first nuclear explosion. How, how would that make you feel about the potential impact of nuclear war on the human race, right? I, I think you would probably become a pacifist and say, this weapon is so terrible, we have got to find a way to... Uh, keep it under control. We are not there yet with the people making these decisions, and certainly not with the governments, right? You know, what policymakers do is they, you know, they listen to experts, they keep their finger in the wind. You got some experts, you know, dangling $50 billion checks and saying, oh, you know, all that Duma stuff, it's just fringe nonsense, don't worry about it, take my $50 billion check. You know, on the other side, you've got very well-meaning, brilliant scientists like, like Jeff Hinton saying, actually, no, this is the end of the human race. But Jeff doesn't have a $50 billion check. So the view is the only way to stop the race is if governments intervene and say, okay, we don't, we don't want this race to go ahead until we can be sure that it's going ahead in absolute safety. Closing off on your career journey, you got a, you received an OB from Queen Elizabeth? Uh, yes. And what was the listed reason for that? 
for the award? Uh, contributions to artificial intelligence research. And you've been listed as a Time Magazine most influential person in, in AI several years in a row, including this year in 2025. Yep. Now, there's two terms here that are central to the things we're going to discuss. One of them is AI and the other is AGI. In my muggle in interpretation of that, it's artificial general intelligence is when the system, the computer, whatever it might be, the technology, has generalized intelligence, which means that it could theoretically see, understand um, the world. It knows everything. It can understand everything in the, the world as well as or better than a human being yep. can do it. And I think take action as well. I mean, so, some people say, oh, you know, AGI doesn't have to have a body. But a good chunk of our intelligence actually is about managing our body, about perceiving the real environment and acting on it, moving, grasping, and so on. So I think that's part of intelligence and, and AGI systems should be able to operate robots successfully. But there's often a misunderstanding, right? That people say, well, if it doesn't have a robot body, then it can't actually do anything. But then if you remember, most of us don't do things with our bodies. Some people do. Bricklayers, painters, gardeners, chefs. Um, but people who do podcasts, you're doing it with your mind, right? You're doing it with your ability to, to produce language. Uh, you know, Adolf Hitler didn't do it with his body. He did it by producing language. I hope you're not comparing us. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, so even an AGI that has no body, uh, it actually has more access to the human race than Adolf Hitler ever did because it can send emails and texts to, what, three quarters of the world's population directly. It, can, it also speaks all of their languages. And it can devote 24 hours a day to each individual person on earth to convince them of, to do whatever it wants them to do. And our whole society runs down on the internet. I mean, if there's an issue with the internet, everything breaks down in society. Airplanes become grounded and we'll have electricity running off as internet systems. So, I mean, my entire life, it seems to run off the internet now. Yeah, water supply. So, so this is one of the routes by which AI systems could bring about a medium-sized catastrophe is by basically shutting down our life support systems. Do you believe that at some point in the coming decades, we'll arrive at a point of AGI where these systems are generally intelligent? Uh, yes, I think it's virtually certain unless something else intervenes, like a nuclear war, or, or we may refrain from doing it. But I think it will be extraordinarily difficult uh, for us to refrain. When I look down the list of predictions from the top 10 AI CEOs on when AGI will arrive, you've got Sam Altman, who's the founder of OpenAI slash ChatGPT, um, says before 2030. Demis at DeepMind says 2030 to 2035. Jensen from NVIDIA says around five years. Dario at Anthropic says 2026, 2027, powerful AI close to AGI. Elon says in the 2020s. Um, and I go down the list of all of them, and they're all saying relatively within five years. I actually think it'll take longer. I don't think you can make a prediction based on engineering um, in the sense that Yes, we could make machines 10 times bigger and 10 times faster, but that's probably not the reason why we don't have AGI, right? In fact, I think we have far more computing power than we need for AGI, maybe a thousand times more than we need. The reason we don't have AGI is because we don't understand how to make it properly. Um, what we've seized upon is one particular technology called the language model. And we observed that as you make language models bigger, they produce text language that's more coherent and sounds more intelligent. And so 
mostly what's been happening in the last few years is just, okay, let's keep doing that. Because one thing companies are very good at, unlike universities, is spending money. They have spent gargantuan amounts of money and they're going to spend even more gargantuan amounts of money. I mean, you know, we mentioned nuclear weapons. So the Manhattan Project uh, in World War II to develop nuclear weapons, its budget in 2025 dollars was about 20 odd billion dollars. The budget for AGI is going to be a trillion dollars next year. So 50 times bigger than the Manhattan Project. Humans have a, a remarkable history of figuring things out when they galvanize towards a shared objective. You know, thinking about the, the moon landings or whatever it might, else it might be through history. And the thing that makes this feel all, all quite inevitable to me is just the sheer volume of money being invested into it. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Well, there's never been anything like this in history. Is this the biggest technology project in human history by orders of magnitude? And there doesn't seem to be anybody that is pausing to ask the questions about safety. It doesn't even, it doesn't even appear that there's room for that in such a race. I think that's right. To varying extents, each of these companies has a division that focuses on safety. Does that division have any sway? Can they tell the other divisions, no, you can't release that system? Not really. Um, I think some of the companies do take it more seriously. Anthropic uh, does. I think Google DeepMind. Even there, I think the commercial imperative to be at the forefront is absolutely vital. If a company is perceived as, you know, falling behind and not likely to be competitive, not likely to be the one to reach AGI first, then people will move their money elsewhere very quickly. And we saw some quite high profile departures from company like, companies like OpenAI. Um, I know a chap called Jan Liek left, who was working on AI safety at OpenAI. And he said that the reason for his leaving was that safety culture and processes have processes have taken a backseat to shiny products at OpenAI, and he gradually lost trust in leadership, but also Ilya Sutskova? Uh, Ilya Sutskova, yeah. Sutskova? So he was the co-founder uh, co and chief scientist for a while. And then, yeah, so he and Jan Leica were the main safety people. Um, and so when they say 